This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform where entrepreneurs can easily create and customize their own personal or professional website. More on Squarespace later in the video. So hello and welcome to yet another episode of Geographics. I'm your host, Carl Smallwood, and today we're talking about Woodstock. Sex, drugs, peace, love, and rock and roll. And as with all the videos here on Geographics, this one is based on a script submitted to us by a member of our writing team. That being James CJ, whose social links you can find below alongside my own. But since we're talking about Woodstock and hippies and all that good stuff, it only feels right to, you know, get in the spirit of things and whack on a bit of tie-dye. So, there we go. Ah, let's get to it. The 1960s in America was a tumultuous time. Civil rights movements, political assassinations, the Vietnam War, protests against the war and civil rights and the emergence of the generation gap headlined the decade. The 60s was also the primary decade of the hippies. Peace-loving, anti-war, free spirits and America's attitude towards hippies was volatile at best. Their make love not war mantra wasn't the main reason for the growing disdain towards the counterculture movement, but instead their rejection of what many believe to be the core values of American life. Their advocacy for open sexual relationships, revised relationships to recreational drug use and spiritual guidance beyond the bounds of the Christian dogma just didn't sit well with most in middle America. At the core of the hippie way of life was music, folk and rock music were considered to be essential to the hippie movement and culture. At the tail end of the decade, a music festival in Bethel, New York would bring every aspect of the hippie movement together in one place for three glorious days of peace, music and more importantly, freedom. This is the story of Woodstock, one of history's most legendary and perhaps infamous festivals, at least until Fire Festival happened. Woodstock didn't start out as a festival, in fact it was just a small item in the plan created by two friends, those friends being Michael Lang and Artie Kornfeld. Lang was an experienced hand at music festivals, having recently organised the successful Miami Pops Music Festival in 1968. Kornfeld, on the other hand, was the Capitol Records, and I quote, Vice President of Rock. Together, these two music lovers came up with the idea to open a recording studio in Woodstock, New York, which led them to find investors. This is where John Roberts and Joel Rosenman entered the picture. Roberts and Rosenman had experience in music, having been involved in building a recording studio in Manhattan, which was still underway at the time. To Lang and Kornfeld's disappointment, they weren't interested in another studio. However, the line item about a press party got their attention. Kornfeld explained the idea of having an opening day concert, the idea of a festival emerged from this and they told Lang and Kornfeld to devise a plan for a music festival instead. Eventually Lang and Kornfeld returned with a plan for a music festival. Together the four partnered up and founded Woodstock Ventures Incorporated. According to Lang he was responsible for the festival organisation and talent. Kornfeld was in charge of advertising and publicity and for the most part Roberts and Rosenman were to be footing the bill and handling administrative duties and things like ticket distribution. And just I love the idea of like Woodstock Ventures Incorporated. And fun fact, uh, I myself own a company, and that company is called Big Wangers Incorporated Limited. This is just one of those things that you have to do when you're like a content creator online and you have any like you know significant amount of turnover and income. Uh, you just advise just set up a corporation or limited company through which to like you know put your profits and stuff to protect you from liability issues and the like. And I was told you can call your company whatever you want, so I just chose Big Wangers Incorporated Limited because it was funny. You know, Carl Smallwood, Big Wangers. The jokes write themselves. I also tried to incorporate my business on a place in Sheffield called um, uh, Peniston Road, which everyone misreads as Penis Town Road, but I was um, uh, unfortunately unable to do so. The journey to Woodstock was filled with inner turmoil, issues, and numerous setbacks, and they were hardly aware that they were well on their way to making history. Oh, hello there! You caught me in the in between time. Where this is where sponsors are, and today's sponsor is Squarespace. Ah, so the book I was reading, guys, is Canine Core. I've often been told you don't judge a book by its cover. You judge Canine Core by its cover. <laughs> and what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and sell people not on Canine Core but on today's sponsor, Squarespace. Tell me about Squarespace off camera, Brad and Nisha. But Squarespace is a platform you can use to make your own website. See, this always freaks me out. Why is there a website that makes websites? Well, it's like when programs have to be made with code in. How do you make the programs that code code? Let's move on. It's been specially designed for anyone, so it's not just for amateurs, not just professionals, it's for anyone who... But here's the thing. It's easy to assume that like, these features wouldn't be useful, because we're all... 
familiar with how the internet works, but if you've ever seen, like, your mum try to double-click on something using her computer, and she goes... It's nice to have tools that cater to all levels of skill. Yeah, the thing about the fluid engine is that you can add whatever element you want. You can just drag it and drop it in, and... It's, I mean, as somebody who's made a website once on a website making once. software. Yeah, once. But that's what I mean. As someone who's made it on software, this sounds so much easier. So that's the thing I always hear when people say I make websites. It's like, I made a website once. <laughs> it's, it's always once. But you don't need more than one. Well, what if you, you know, if you want to change what you do? And that's the thing. You might want to change what you do, and if you change what it is that you do, you can do that very easily by just changing all the elements. Well, what would you add to your website? Like, what would be the splash screen? Like, what would you want to, like, symbolise you? If, like, if, here's a website that's for Nisha. Because for me, it'd be a picture of me doing this. Probably me holding Luna or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> just holding your kitty cat. So I'll tell you what you could do. Behind the scenes, we're going to mock up just, like, a splash screen for our own websites. Mine's just me going, like... Nisha is her holding her kitty cat. And what is it for you, Brad? I reckon sunglasses in front of an explosion. Let's say you want to add more features than that to a website. Let's say you want to add uh, payment options. Can Squarespace handle that? Obviously, you can sell products on Squarespace if you want to. You can also sell your time in the form of a course. So if you like to educate people, you can upload courses, and then you can sell those for a subscription fee or for a one-time payment. I want to see someone who sells a course on how to make a Squarespace website. I want to it's see got that. To exist. It's, the thing is, it must do because obviously it's one of those things where you know it's the you can't exist not online these days, and everyone needs a website. Yeah, and one thing that's really useful for a, a shop or a course is to be able to contact the people who are uh, interested. Obviously, yeah. Squarespace has the ability to build a mailing list. You can add it to the website. You can then sign up to that. Well, others can sign up to the mailing list, and then. Obviously, if you want to start an email campaign, you can send them out to everybody and inform them of yeah. when things come out. Just send people a picture of your cat every single day. And also, just as a content creator, a feature that I greatly appreciate just being advertised is just comprehensive analytics overviews. Because analytics online are king. You may not think they are, but they are. They are the lifeblood of all content you see online. And the ability to just know who is looking at your website for how long and all those other like numbers that no one really pays attention to, but they probably should, is just an incredibly useful feature that Squarespace boasts. And yeah. So thank you to today's sponsor, Squarespace. If anything we talked about today sounds all interesting to you, check out their website, www.squarespace.com forward slash geographics for 10% off on your first purchase of a website forward slash domain using the code geographics. Thank you. Things got off to a pretty rocky start from the get-go. The first venue Lion Cornfeld wanted up in Woodstock was immediately rejected by the town. The second venue, on the other hand, was more of a misunderstanding on Lang's part. Roberts and Rosenman met with a lawyer on March 25th, 1969, and learned that the landowner had no real intention of ever letting them use the land. After these failures, Roberts and Rosenman took the lead on finding a venue for themselves. Their search led to a 600-acre industrial park up in Wallkill, New York, owned by Howard Mills. Roberts and Rosenman described the land as barren and hilly with a small paved road, fallow fields, red soil, and about 50 acres of apple trees, and the mills as home, of course. They discussed their desire to rent the land, do some work to make it suitable for hosting a festival, and then return it to its original condition. The owner of the farm agreed, and they wasted no time signing the papers, and their meeting with the zoning board on April 18th, 1969, led to them getting initial approval that they needed. Woodstock Ventures managed to secure officers, and hiring began to pick up, making them a far more legitimate company. They were in business, at least for now. While things were looking up, there were still a couple of glaring issues, including the talent needed to actually put on the show. They'd been trying to get musicians involved, but no big acts were jumping at the opportunity. That is until they managed to sign Credence Clearwater Revival, which was a significant deal which helped convince other artists that this was indeed a legitimate festival, helping them get other acts to sign on. Next on the agenda was getting the ticketing set up. The four partners had decided on August 15th, 16th and 17th for the festival and priced the tickets at $7 for a day, $13 dollars for two days and eighteen dollars for all three and it's like now everyone who's been to a festival in the last five to ten years just think about the idea of paying twenty dollars for a you know a three-day ticket to a festival the last festival i went to 
I paid that for a beer. For distribution, they use numerous northeastern head shops and boutiques as distributors, granting them advertising and a 5% cut. By May 15, 1969, things were coming together for the Woodstock Ventures partners. However, they were far from ready to host the festival and they were about to realise the most significant issue they needed to solve, feeding the masses. It was June 1969 when the partners were discussing the idea of porta potties, of which they booked over a thousand for the event, when the realisation struck them that they'd need food for people attending the event if they were ever going to use said porta potties. Most caterers and vendors weren't really interested in doing the event, considering the time and expense it would be to bring food to such an out there location, especially with the fear that the whole thing wouldn't pan out. Michael Lang's contacts secured vendors for the event after weeks of discussions, but Roberts wasn't convinced the plan was good. Mainly because they wanted money up front, but agreed to meet with them anyway. At these meetings, Jeff Jorger and his two partners mapped out how to provide food for the event. However, one problem explained the need for money up front. They had none to make it happen. They needed about $75,000 to set up shop. In return for the investment, they split profits 50% with Woodstock Ventures. This $75,000 investment also came with the responsibility of building the booths and providing electricity and plumbing to them. The three partners in this food endeavour decided to keep with the peaceful vibes of the festival by naming their food joint Food for Love Incorporated. As desperate as they were, their choice of vendors would come back to bite them in the arse later on. Right now though, something else was brewing that was about to throw the entire festival into question. The four partners into panic mode. It was no secret to many Woodstock Ventures employees, including its founders, that they enjoyed the Mary Jane, the marijuana, the, the devil's lettuce, and rumbles in Wallkill about fears surrounding the festival were rattling the organisers. To combat this issue, Rosenman was asked for a solution. His answer came with an altogether unintended consequence. The idea was to circulate a non-smoking memo stating that any employee of Woodstock Ventures found smoking, the Mary Jane would be fired and handed over to the authorities. Unfortunately, this didn't have the effect they thought it would. In the town's eyes, the memo all but confirmed their fears. The town began meeting to discuss the Woodstock issue and the result would be catastrophic. At another zoning board meeting on June 12, 1969, the room was filled with furious locals. They were there to speak against Woodstock. Lang spoke about what the festival would be and fielded questions. Rosamond and Roberts spoke about the logistics and even Mills advocated for Woodstock. They wouldn't get their answer immediately though, considering a new local law was pending. And on July 2nd, 1969, Roberts and Rosamond, while at dinner celebrating the opening of their studio, were informed that the ordinance had passed. It was official. Wallkill Woodstock was dead. By July 15th, 1969, they'd made about $537,123 in ticket sales. Unfortunately, they had nowhere to host the festival, and as a result, they were having problems with the lineup. At the time, the team did their best to manage the fallout, distribute as hot sales until they were satisfied that Woodstock would actually happen at a new venue. They looked around for a new venue, but kept coming up empty-handed. Then, things changed with a single call from Lang. A guy called Max Yasger reached out to Lang and invited him to view a property, and if they liked it, they could rent it for $50,000 and an additional $75,000. $75,000 in escrow for potential property damage. The 600-acre dairy pasture farm in Bethel, New York was beyond perfect for Woodstock, so they jumped at the opportunity, thus saving the entire festival. As far as miracles go, Yasga came pretty close. Almost immediately, the team began running ads in every newspaper they could get into, stating the venue changed. They also started solidifying the lineup, with most performers demanding more money for the inconvenience of having to change where they were going. When it came to the venue, the team made a pretty cautious effort to avoid repeating the mistakes of Wallkill by ensuring that the community trusted them. For this task, they hired one Dan Ganang, a man of the cloth who'd been asked to help avoid being kicked out, which he achieved through vigorous efforts to engage with the town and its community, easing their minds and slowly gaining their trust. Trusts. His efforts worked out, but a mistake would set the town ablaze with efforts against Woodstock once again. So it all started when Gunnell learned of the rumbles in town against the festival, so he decided to just give the people a vague idea of what Woodstock would be like on an admittedly much smaller scale. So he put on a show and used the Earthlight Theatre Troupe. Earthlight were a group of hippies who performed skits about nature, peace and love. Perfect, right? So. This went monumentally wrong when they went off book, stripped naked, and began screaming at the townspeople who had their children with them, that they were repressed, rednecks, and this prompted, unsurprisingly, a town meeting with one thing on the agenda. Stop Woodstock. 
again. Unfortunately, the issues the town had came up too late. The wheels were already in motion and things were happening so fast they couldn't really be stopped. To prepare for the fallout coming later, Woodstock Ventures Incorporated hired a bevy of lawyers to descend on White Lake, ready to handle any potential fallout from the festival. They weren't ready, nothing could prepare them for what was coming. And again, nothing says peace, love and all that hippie nonsense like an army of lawyers working for a giant corporation. By August 10th, 1969, the festival was just a few days away, and it was one of the most stressful times for anyone involved. Issues were popping up everywhere, like construction taking longer than it should have, food not arriving on time, and things needing to be built. On August 11th, they received a call from Danganau informing them that the town was turning against them. The news came as a shock. Lang, who'd been stationed in the area, had gone AWOL, which prompted Rosenman to head to White Lake to sort everything out, much to his own annoyance. Lang was eventually found at the festival site, just fooling around. Rosenman, now in White Lake, decided to take advantage of the time by talking to neighbouring farms and renting them out partially for three days while offering insurance and clean-up services post-festival. Rosenman knew that it was likely they'd be used in some capacity by festival goers, ignoring the no trespassing policy. On August 12th, things were getting, somehow, even worse. The building permits they'd been authorised in writing before the whole debacle weren't authorised, meaning the buildings they'd begun building were in violation of city ordinance. Rosenman did manage to wrangle the building inspector into authorising them after the fact, and considering this was required by law, that was a pretty, you know, good thing that he did that. Having work permits, though, didn't really help that the work was going at a glacial pace. Food for Love was also complaining that their setup wasn't ready, and they were also having internal arguments about the unpreparedness on their own part. The Food for Love issue was much larger than initially anticipated, because most of the problems came from the leaders of the endeavour. They learned just days before the festival was set to begin that two of the three partners in Food for Love had no prior experience working in food concessionaire work. You couldn't make this up which makes it easy to understand why things were about to go just oh, oh so wrong. In the final days of prepping for the festival, things were coming together, just not fast enough for anyone's needs. However, by Wednesday night, two days before the festival began, there were already nearly 50,000 people on site, arriving and setting up camp. Most things were ready to go, except the stages and the ticketing booths. Despite their best efforts to ensure people were buying tickets, it quickly became apparent that this just wasn't going to happen. They'd fallen so far behind that ticket kiosks simply weren't ready. The fence was flimsy, and while some people paid, most people found other ways into the festival area. Some attendees trespassing in the aforementioned nearby farms to bypass the admittedly sparse security measures. It was made worse when part of the fence collapsed, creating what was referred to as a 21st entrance. Making profit was over. Woodstock officially became a free festival. Food for Love continued to be an issue as it had been pretty much the entire time, eventually threatening to leave altogether unless the agreement changed. Considering the situation, Woodstock Ventures was forced to accept their offer of getting their $75,000 back and letting Food for Love keep all of the profits that they made. As the festival inched ever closer, traffic in the area became a significant problem, to the point people began simply abandoning their cars in various locations and walking the rest of the way. This, however, created another issue, and that was getting the performers to Woodstock. The dilemma prompted the partners to retain the services of, I'm not making this up, a helicopter to get the performers to festival grounds. And nothing says peace and love like a helicopter. And this was just more money adding to the already growing losses. And at this point, the focus was more on getting through the festival rather than profiting from it. It was becoming clearer by the hour that the original thought of 100,000 people attending Woodstock was so far off the reality of the situation on the ground, Woodstock was woefully unprepared for what was coming. And what was coming was half a million unwashed hippies. The evidence was undeniable. They had no security, not enough facilities, not enough water, not enough food supplies. It was all just not enough. Issues were popping up all over the festival. It took 30 minutes to get water, an hour to use a toilet, a severe lack of security and over 5,000 health issues prompted the need for medical reinforcements. And that was just scratching the surface. Additionally, food was an issue with Food for Love overwhelmed, fires burned two of their concession stands down, and they were running out of food very quickly. At one point, they began just handing out cups of granola in the performance area to feed the 400,000 hungry hippies. Food was also 
also airlifted into Woodstock to help ensure that people got fed. To the credit of the people attending Woodstock, it didn't seem they were phased by this issue. It's likely thanks to the copious amounts of drugs, but also just the festival's overall vibe. The ever-growing number of attendees relished in the atmosphere of freedom. Come rain or shine, hunger or thirst, they were there for that freedom, and in a sense, they were home. As the festival raged on, more people came from all over the country for Woodstock. They got lost in the music of great musicians like Janis Joplin, Crosby, Stills and Nash, The Who, Credence Clearwater Revival, and so, so many others. They communed with the people and watched as the grass-covered hills of White Lake turned into mud as the rain continued its relentless downpour. It was a drug-infused festival of good vibes and intentions. During the festival, Rosenman and Roberts were helping ensure everything was go as well as it could. Lang and Kornfeld handled the talents and technical staff at the festival grounds, and their efforts were helped by the legendary Hog Farm and its leader, Wavy Gravy, who are credited as the true saviours of Woodstock. So much so, they get their own section. The Hog Farm was perhaps one of the most integral parts of Woodstock. This peacekeeping group of volunteers from New Mexico were hired to help with general and medical assistance. And their leader was a man named Wavy Gravy. He was a perfect spokesperson for Woodstock and fit in quite well with the festival goers and their overall vibe. The Hog Farm was an essential part of Woodstock as it picked up the slack and helped foster a safe environment for festival goers. This service cost Woodstock just $17,000 and by all measures, this was money very well spent. And one of Hog Farm's many other talents that eventually became quite useful during the festival was the ability to spot good acid from bad acid. Considering the organisers' concerns about drugs, they saw this as yet another incredible selling point of hiring Hog Farm. Wavy Gravy was considered to be a fixture of the festival, constantly talking to the crowd and keeping good vibes alive even as rain poured relentlessly on the festival goers. Considering all that went wrong, having Hog Farm was a tremendous help to Woodstock Ventures and the festival. With things wrapping up, the reality of the road ahead was becoming just slightly clearer, much like the weather. Woodstock ended on Monday, August 18th, with Jimi Hendrix finishing his set to a diminished but still impressive audience of 25,000 people at 6am, after countless attendees had already left. As you can imagine, the aftermath of Woodstock was just as chaotic as the festival itself. Thanks to the rain and heavy foot traffic, the farm was a muddy mess made worse by the presence of just a lot of trash and poop and just human effluence of all kinds. It took several days, bulldozers, tens of thousands of dollars, and the help of Hog Farm and other volunteers to get the site as close to its original form as possible. The Hog Farm, instead of merely helping, had gone above and beyond by taking control of the entire cleanup operation. Considering Woodstock became a free festival, it was clear the organisers weren't going to be turning anything close to a profit, and the main funds of the festival were going to lose but it's simply a lot of money. That loss was eventually calculated to be about $1.6 million. With Woodstock over, the time for peace and love was over. Between the partners, things were about to get ugly because lawyers were about to get involved. Although Woodstock made history, it was, for all intents and purposes, a disaster from the get-go. This was largely due to a few factors, underestimating the audience, haphazard planning, and a partnership that was beyond dysfunctional. The approach to business between the two sets of partners wasn't a small divide, it was a chasm. One side was laid back and at times wholly ineffective, and the other were footing the bill and trying to steer what was essentially a sinking ship. The downfall of Woodstock Ventures was inevitable, but how it happened was far more brutal than any of the four partners likely envisioned. When faced with debt, Lang and Kornfeld came up with a novel solution. Roberts and Rosamond would put their stock in the company in escrow and personally guarantee the debt. After this, Lang and Kornfeld, with new partners, would form a new corporation and exploit the Woodstock name, footage and recordings they'd made to make their money back and cover some of the expenses. Finally, Roberts and Rosamond's stock would be released into the hands of the new partners. This prompted a back and forth resulting in a major legal battle. Lang and Kornfeld refused to do anything until their demands were met. However, thanks to a fairly ruthless entertainment lawyer by the name of Chuck Setton, who figured out who held all the cards, after six weeks of negotiations, Lang and Kornfeld parted ways with the company with a minor payout. Woodstock Ventures were now just a company trying to fix the damage to its reputation. While the original idea Lang and Kornfeld had would have exploited not only the Woodstock name, but their own partners, some of the plan wasn't bad. They did have, for example, ample footage of the festival which Warner Brothers, whom Kornfeld had managed to get on board prior to the festival becoming, in no uncertain words, a 
the show loved and Woodstock Ventures also made recordings of the performances which they'd be able to cash in on too. Kornfeld's original contract with Warner Brothers was later described as a Woodstock special, meaning that it was over-promising and under-delivering. And by accepting a share of the profits from the film, Warner Bros forgave the breaches of contract. Thankfully, the film was a blockbuster by documentary standards and released in 1971, the aptly titled Woodstock made some $50 million at the box office. By December 31st, 1973, the festival had made about $3.3 million, $1.5 million of which came from the movie and records and licensing deals and so on. In total, they spent about $3.4 million on the festival in totality, meaning they'd only lost about $100,000, all things considered. And then over the years, each partner would participate in or write a book about the experience, making them additional money, meaning that overall Woodstock did turn a profit, albeit a small one. The legacy of Woodstock is undeniable. It's not only an important part of music history, but history itself. It's estimated that some 1 million people attempted to get to Woodstock at one point or another, with over 500,000 successfully reaching the festival. The legacy of this haphazardly planned festival left behind is the encapsulation of everything the hippie movement was about in the 60s and early 70s. It was perhaps one of those rare times in history when peace and love won in a time of war, injustice and violence. It was their messy American dream and they owned that loudly and indeed proudly. Max Yasgur, the owner of the land that hosted Woodstock, perhaps said it best, stating, and I quote, you've proven something to the world. The important thing that you've proven to the world is that half a million young people can get together and have three days of fun and music and have nothing but fun and music. And God bless you all for it. So I hope everybody found this video entertaining, educational, and informative. I certainly found the script to be all three of those things, and if you agree, why not go give the author a follow at the links you can find below. My, I'm also down there if you want to follow my stuff, and there's also links to the other sister channels to Geographics, Biographics, and Top 10s, which I'm also the interim host for at the moment. Otherwise, if you like the video, leave a like. If you've got anything to say about it, or you'd like to leave some feedback, maybe something else you'd like us to cover, do so in the comments below. On a personal note, if you've got any, like, you know, festival experiences you'd like to vent about in the comments below, also do that. I have been to a handful of festivals in my time and they have all been so poorly run. It just seems like just to go to a festival is to just expect something to go wrong. For example, I attended Slam Dunk this year, which was very poorly ran, um, massively overbooked and to the, to the point where it was like it was hour long queues to get anything like bathroom, water, drinks, food, anything like that. I also went to the ill-fated When We Were Young Festival in Las Vegas last year, um, which did go on without a hitch, but only after the second day. And I had tickets the first day, which was my 30th birthday present. And I didn't get to go. So I traveled all the way to Las Vegas to get told that you're not allowed to go in. And I never got a refund. Yeah. So if you've got any experience like that, let us know in the comments. Otherwise, subscribe for more like this. And as always, as I like to say, have the day you all deserve.